Okay, let's see how we get uh, systems of differential equations for different mechanisms. Um, we'll start with a simple case. Let's, let's imagine we have a reaction where some molecule A is getting transformed into some molecule B. And we're going to assume in the first case, to just make it really simple, that the mechanism by which this happens, the actual chemical steps by which this happens, is exactly the same as the overall reaction. So we'd say, OK, what's all that's happening is some molecule A is just changing into some molecule B. And this is, this is a theoretical assumption. And we, we are allowed to write differential equations for our theoretical assumptions. And so what we, what we basically do is we say, OK, I'm losing A with time. Uh, so the change in the concentration of A, I'm not going to write brackets around the, the chemical species for concentrations, just quicker. So the change in the concentration of A with time, that's going to be negative because we're going to be losing it. And the change in the concentration of B with time, well, that's going to be positive because we're going to be gaining it according to, excuse me, according to the way this arrow down here is drawn. So that's going to be positive. And we're just going to give some rate law for this that depends on how much reactant is present. Every single step in the mechanism will be written uh, according to the reactants in the mechanism, in the mechanistic step, I should say. And we give each step a certain rate constant. We'll just call this one K1. And so I would say, OK, well, the rate for this step is going to be K1 times the concentration of A. It'll be A to the first power, because there's only one A molecule in the, in the reactant side of this step. And so we'd say that D80T is negative K1 times the concentration of A, because that's our rate for this step. Whereas DBDT, that's going to be positive K1 times the concentration of A. So how fast B is accumulated by stoichiometry it's going to be the opposite of how fast A is depleted. And that's, a, that's an easy case. It could be that this mechanism, however, proceeds by a more complicated process. So let's just check this out. We could have, for example, in step one, we could have two molecules of A going to some molecule C. And we could also have that molecule C splitting up and going back to two molecules of A. And then that molecule of C, once it's formed, can move on to form a molecule of A and a molecule of B. So we would say this is a two-step mechanism. And it's always the case that when we propose a mechanism, so in this case we have two mechanistic steps, and it's always got to be the case that our two mechanistic steps, somehow we have to be able to add these together to get our overall reaction. In this case, it's quite simple. You know, If we just add these two together, I'm gaining a C and losing a C, so that's a wash. And I'm, uh, here, I'm gaining an A and losing two A's, so that means I'm ultimately losing one A. So if I add these two together, I end up getting A goes to B. Now here, the differential equations are going to be more difficult because we have three species and we have three steps. And I'm going to name these steps K1 for this going in the forward direction, K2 for this going in the reverse direction, which is basically C goes to 2A. I mean, I could just, we could write this as three steps, right? We could just put this like this. Rather than writing this reverse arrow, we could just write 2A goes at rate K1 to C. And then C goes at rate constant K2 back to 2A. And then here in our third step, C goes back to A plus B, so we're going to call this rate constant K3. Now, what's going to be the change in the concentration of A with time? Well, if we look at step one, actually, we should recognize that all three steps um, influence the concentration of A's, because in step K1, I'm losing A. In step K2, I'm gaining A. And in step K3, 
I'm gaining A. So let's see, let's, let's do this. So the change in A with time, let's see, K1 is going to cause us to lose some A. So I'm going to write a negative K1. Step two is going to have me gain some A. And it's actually going to have me gain uh, twice A. So I better put a 2K2. And of course, over here, I'm losing 2A for every time this goes. So I should have done a negative 2. Sorry, that's a little messy, but a negative 2K1 for this step. And then in step 3 for A, we're going to have a positive K3. Because in the third step, we gain A. All right, that's a bit messy. Let's just rewrite it. So dA dt is going to be a negative 2k1 plus 2k2 plus k3. Now, what are the concentration dependencies of these steps? Well, if we look at step k1, which is in this direction, in step k1, the reactant's A, but there's two of them. So two A molecules have to collide in order to form a molecule of C. So because of that, this step is going to be dependent on the concentration of A to the second power. So this is always going to be related to how many reactant molecules are colliding in each case. For step K2, the reaction is driven by how much C is present and C alone. And so step K2 will be based on the concentration of C to the first power, because there's only one C molecule. And then step K3, that's also going to be dependent on the concentration of C to the first power. So we would write it like this. And just to, just to show you, if there was a reversible step here, where A plus B goes back to C, we'd call that K4. We could write it like this, A plus B goes back to C in step K4. In this case, we'd have to add another term for DADT, and that would be, uh, let's see, we're losing uh, a molecule of A in this step, so I'd put a negative here. It's going to be based on rate constant K4. It's only one A that we're losing, so I don't put a 2 out in front or anything like that. And then the concentration dependence on this step is going to depend on both the concentration of A and the concentration of B, because one of these collides with one of these in that particular step. All right? So that would be, there'd be four terms. There'd be four terms for the change in concentration of A with time. And if we, if we look at this, we see that there's, in K1, we're flowing away from A, so we're losing A. So that's our first term. In step two, we're gaining A, so that's our second term. In step three, we're gaining A, so that's a positive K3 for our third term. And then in step four, we'd be losing A, and so there's a negative term for that one there. Okay, let's, let's look at dBdt and see what that would be. So dBdt, based on our concentrations, we're going to say, okay, Step K1, we have two A's going to a C. B is not involved in this, so we don't include a K1 term. The second term, we have C going back to 2A. Again, we don't have B involved, so we don't have a K2 term for dBdt. We do have a B involved in steps K3 and K4. In step uh, K3, we're gaining some B, one molecule of B, so we're gaining it. How many? We're gaining one. I can write the one in here just, just for emphasis. It's being uh, run at rate constant K3, so it's 1K3, and we're going to write this based on the concentration of C because this reaction in the forward direction depends upon the reactants over here that are running in this direction. In step K4, we're going to lose a single B. So I'm going to write negative K4. Don't need to put the one out in front. 
and then we're going to be running this, uh, it's going to be dependent on the concentration of A and the concentration of B, both to the first power, because those are our reactants here. So it's going to be A, B, like that. And then finally, if we were going to run DC, DT, this one might be a little hard because I don't know here. Let's do it like this. Let's do it like this. Okay, here we go. We can run DC, DT like this. All right, DC by DT. Let's see, C is involved in step K1. It's involved in step K2. It's involved in step K3. And it's involved in step K4. It looks like it's gained in the K1 step. And in step K1, that's going to be dependent upon two molecules of A colliding. So we're going to need to write A to the second power. The next step here, let's see, we're losing C here, so I got to write a negative K2, and that's dependent upon C to the first power. And then in step three, it looks like we're losing C, so I got to go negative K3 there, and that's dependent upon C to the first power, just the reactant. And then for the reverse step, which we can, of course, write like this, A plus B going back to C, we're gaining C, and that's going to be dependent upon the concentration of A to the first power and B to the first power. And then if I was running this in Excel, you know, we can't, um, we can't do infinitesimally small changes in Excel. We can only do incremental changes. So instead of dc dt, we change that to the change in the concentration of C over the change in time. And so for each subsequent step, uh, well, let's just write it here. We, you know, this would be the same k1a squared minus k2c minus k3c plus k4ab. And what we do is multiply both sides of this by delta T, whatever we set our incremental time unit to. So our change in the concentration of C with every time increment is going to be this very large, well, I should say four-term expression. All of this multiplied by the time increment that we choose. And by squeezing this time increment down as small as possible, you know, then we approach better values because, of course, we're getting closer to the infinitesimally small unit change in time. The issue with that in, in Excel is that it's, it takes a long time, a lot of rows to calculate. The smaller you make this delta T, the more rows it's going to take for you to calculate out uh, changes in time over longer periods of time. All right, let Professor Campbell know uh, if this answers your question and if this makes things clear. Hopefully you can apply this type of reasoning to other mechanisms, but don't be afraid to, you know, to ask if, you, if you're having trouble. I will be happy to do other videos for any mechanisms that you're having trouble modeling.